so jihad has four com components to it so the definition of jihad is you are putting your best effort exerting yourself struggling to be the best in the eyes of god so the very first concept of jihad is self improvement you want to make yourself better in the eyes of god so suppose when i go to work fighting the chicago traffic go to work get an earning for my family i am doing jihad to feed my family when the ladies when they go out with the hijab they are doing jihad because they are holding to the principles of islam despite the hate and the negative perception that people are giving to them right. taking care of our parents is jihad so that's the personal jihad the jihad to make the society better is the next level is that by blood drive and food drive and clothing drive and march against violence march against racism you're putting your efforts your money your talent you make the society better that is the second form of jihad the third form of jihad would be self protection if an enemy is trying to compromise you your family your nation your property it's a god given right to defend yourself even in that self defense as i mentioned before you cannot harm touch or kill innocent people means non combatants there is no carpet bombing there is no hiroshima nagasaki in islam even if the enemy comes and destroys your civilians even then the muslims don't have the uh, permission to harm touch or kill the civilians of the enemy that's how careful we are supposed to be even in a just war in a jihad and last but not the least the fourth concept of jihad is to take away the oppression if people are suppressed their their rights and freedoms are taken away god conscious people coming together remove the oppression so they can live in freedom under god so these are the four concepts of jihad first one self improvement second one society improvement third one self defense fourth one saving lives by removing the oppression so these are the four s's right? so jihad at the end of the day it's not holy war there is no concept of holy war in islam by the way you know in arabic holy war is harb muqaddasa in arabic those words they don't occur anywhere in the quran they don't occur anywhere in the hadith literature means in the sayings and practices of muhammad peace be upon him so in a nutshell jihad is to bring self peace and society's peace and jihad came to fight terrorism and extremism and jihad is the opposite of terrorism so jihad is self struggle to make ourselves and the society better question yes yeah i have a quick question so what does since like the fourth point that you said was self defense and jihad so what is that was the third point third point what does self defense look like for muslim self defense suppose 2 am in the morning if i hear a big bang on the door and then i see from the hall that there are some uh, people out there with chains and guns and to compromise me my life my family my property obviously i need to pick up a baseball bat or a cricket bat right and uh, press uh, what do you call the adt alarm perhaps uh, call the police and if they break in i defend myself i fight them something similar to the country by the way to an islamic state that if people are oppressed dictators are there human rights are taken away that good conscious people not just in that country all of humanity should come together to remove oppression not just from the muslims but from any segment of the society may that be white black christian jew atheist anyone anyone who is oppressed jihad means to remove the oppression and give them the rights and the dignity and the humanity but in any form of jihad even if we kill one single non combatant we are going against the spirit of jihad it's really important if any person is doing that we blame them but not jihad or islam i hope you understand that right question yes ma'am uh, so you said like god's fairness and justice is really important in islam how do like muslim muslims talk about and like view god's love too sure So the question is how do Muslims view the love of God you know out of the 100 plus names of God one of the name is that he is al wadud that means he is a loving god and for the love of God you know after God created the universe he could have just left 
us alone without guiding us. So the love of God means God is guiding us. Love of God means, you know, the wonderful sandwiches that they ate before you guys came. <laughs> right? That is also the love of God. The oxygen that we breathe is the love of God. God appointing prophets and messengers because he wants to put us into paradise. That is also the love of God. Even for those who do not believe in God, the atheists, he's giving them chance over chance over chance. That is also the love of God. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, do they have to know the Arabic language to read the Quran? Okay, so the Quran is in the Arabic language, as you know. A person does not have to understand to read the Quran, but if they also understand, obviously that's even better because it's a message from God. I'm not an Arab, my native tongue is not Arabic. It is uh, Hindi and Urdu, by the way, right? Like yours, <laughs> right? So I don't understand Arabic as much as a native Arab speaker, but I can read the whole Quran. You know, my six-year-old and my 10-year-old and even Hassan out there, they can all read the Quran. They have read the Quran. So just by reading the Quran, it's also a blessing. And as I was mentioning uh, to some of you, Quran is a miracle because there is a prophecy in the Quran that this is from God and He's going to protect it from it getting corrupted. This is in chapter 15, verse number 9 of the Quran. So you'll be amazed to find out that right now, today, there are 10 million Muslims who memorize the whole Quran. So how much of Biology 101 have you memorized? The book, right? One page, two page, maybe not. It's not easy. But just imagine, in Arabic, even young people who are like less than 10 years of age, they memorize. You know, this mosque and all, almost all the mosques in the U.S., in the world, they have special programs when people, children, they come together and they memorize the Quran within two years, three years. Along with taking other subjects, they memorize the whole Quran. Our Imam, right, the Imam that you saw uh, and you heard, he's a memorizer of the whole Quran. Yeah? You know, Sister Faria, who's sitting up there in the back, uh, she can wave the hand up there if she wants to. Her two children, they memorize the whole Quran. MashaAllah. So it, this is one of the miracles of the Quran in Arabic. The Quran has 500 plus scientific facts in there. How the universe began, uh, about embryology, about cosmology, about the shape of the earth as being round, about the expansion of the universe. So all these facts we say, that this is not just a book, it has many signs in there that God is speaking to us that this book is coming not from a human but from a superhuman source which we say is God. Yes sir? Uh, correct me if I say anything that's wrong, uh, but my understanding of uh, the teachings of the Quran is that it teaches that Jesus was virgin born and sinless but the Muhammad was not. So how is Muhammad the greatest prophet? Okay. So, so the question is, uh, the, the Quran speaks about Jesus as being sinless and uh, born of a virgin. And what about the rest of the people, people who are born, right? So th according to Islamic theology, all the prophets, they are innocent. They, de they don't make any, any sin or any mistake in their prophetic responsibility. Number one. Number two, the Quran answers that question that Jesus is born of Virgin Mary. He doesn't have a father. So God may be his father, right? That's what our Christian brothers will say. So the Quran responds to this in chapter 3 of the Quran, verse number 59. So the translation is this, that the likeness of Jesus in the eyes of God is similar to the likeness of Adam. He was made from dust or clay and God say be commanded and he was created. So what God is saying that yes, Jesus did not have a father and Adam did not have a father. And they are both equal that God is the creator of Adam and Jesus. I'm not really sorry, if, but we, I think we need to be going soon for Spring Arbor. I don't know about our brothers and sisters from Indiana Wesleyan or not, but, sure, sure. but if that's okay. And then if, if some of you, I saw there are some other hands that are going up. So what we can do, if we if we want to go and use the restroom, the people that have questions, if it's okay, maybe we can talk out in the um, in the foyer there. 
that's, I'm sorry, that's my turn, but sure. maybe in the hallway, if you have other questions for Dr. Sabdil, you can feel free to ask them there. While some of you are using the restroom, we're getting ready to go. Uh, but I can't speak for my colleague here. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So again, on behalf of MCC and the Muslim community, thanks for coming and supporting and learning. And I hope that this is not the only time. Come back again, either as a group or individuals with your family. This is not just a place of worship for the Muslims. We are welcome all of our brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. You guys can stay here if you want. Welcome, right? It's up to you. Yeah. yeah. If you guys have more questions, then stick around and talk to them. Yeah, feel free to. I'm sorry that, you know, I made um, the intro part was done before you guys came. Yeah, no, it was, that was a misunderstanding. Okay, so okay. We'll just but I can still give out. a short intro, a abridged intro of the basics of Islam. And then at least you will have a bigger picture, right? Because in the second session, it was mostly kind of Q&A. Yeah. Like bits and pieces from here and there. So maybe like in five, ten minutes, I can just give a brief intro, and then if you have time, Q and A. If you have to leave, it's up to you. Do you need to talk to uh, them? No, no, we can we can figure that out. I think we'll be here for a little while. It normally takes some while these restrooms anyway. I'll will say goodbye in a minute. Okay. When you're done. Okay. Okay. okay Thank fine. You very much. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Welcome, guys. Yes. So fine. Okay, sit down. I think it, I mean, for me and maybe maybe for you guys, it'd be really helpful. I mean, we saw people come in and you know they'll they'll do this and then this. Mm -hmm. and just walk us through what is that? You know, what what are, what are people praying in their in their hearts and their minds? Sure, what sure. What does the service look like? Yeah. Fine. So when you walked in here, you may have seen Muslims pray, and there were maybe eight hundred thousand people praying. So prayer is one of the five pillars of Islam. The very first pillar of Islam is to recite consciously the testimony of faith. In Arabic, it's called the Shahada. That there is no other God besides one God. In Arabic, his name is Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. So that is the very first pillar. And a person, when he converts to Islam, this is what they recite. So we don't have any baptism. We don't have any rituals. It's just a conscious recitation and making a commitment to apply that in the life. Oneness of God and the messengership of Muhammad peace be upon him. The second pillar is to pray five times a day. The first prayer is before sunrise. Second prayer is early afternoon. Third prayer is late afternoon. Fourth one is after sunset. And the fifth one before we go to sleep when it becomes dark. So when it comes to, okay, so let me run down the three more pillars, then I will come back to the prayer, the details. The third pillar is to give charity to the poor, the needy, the homeless. 2.5% of our saved assets, it's an obligation, not just a good thing, not just an option, it's an obligation for Muslims to give to the needy people. That's the third pillar. The fourth pillar is to fast in the month of, what is it called? Ramadan, right? which is coming around the 5th of May for the Muslims. And the fifth pillar is to go at least once in a lifetime for pilgrimage to Mecca. So when it comes to the prayer, the Friday afternoon prayer is an obligation for every Muslim male to come to the mosque and pray. For the females, it's an option because they may have responsibility to children and household. It's an option. They will get equal reward praying at home compared to a man who is coming and praying in the mosque. But before we pray, we have to cleanse ourselves. Our exposed parts of the body, it's called the wudu. We cleanse ourselves. We have special areas, you know, next to the restroom. People go there and clean themselves. But many of us, like myself, I did that when I was home. So I don't have to, you know, there's like a lot of people in there, just to avoid the rush. People who are coming from their jobs, they do it perhaps in the job area before they come. And as we enter the mosque, we are supposed to pray some optional prayer before we sit down. So as you may have noticed, as people were coming, they were not just sitting down, they were praying quickly and then they were sitting down to listen to the sermon. 
and then the actual prayer is approximately maybe 7 minutes to 12 minutes based upon what part of the Quran and how slow or fast the person is reciting. So the start of the prayer we are supposed to face Mecca. In Mecca is the first and the oldest house of worship built to worship one God. It was built by two prophets, by Prophet Abraham and his son, who was his oldest son? Ishmael, right? Yeah, father and son, they, they created or they made that by permission of God. So every Muslim around the world, we face that same one direction. And then when we fold our hands, we recite the first chapter of the Quran. So the whole prayer is in Arabic. We recite the first chapter of the Quran, not from any book, not from any notes or the phone, we recite it from the memory and then we recite one more passage and then we bow down and then we we recite some names of God God's majesty and then we prostrate and then we recite certain names of God so that completes one unit from the time I stand and fold my hands until I prostrate that's one unit so the early morning prayer has two units so I complete that two times to complete my early morning prayer the afternoon prayer has four units. The late afternoon also has four units. Right after sunset prayer has three units, right? And the night prayer has four units. So basically that's how we pray. And we can pray before and after for extra bonus prayers. Now, these are the five times of worship. But besides the worship five times in the mosque, we can pray anytime, anywhere, any language. Means I can sit in the car and I can say, you know, oh God, bring uh, peace and justice to the world. And I can pray in my native tongue, Arab, uh, not Arabic, Urdu, right? So those prayers can be done anytime, anywhere. Important when we pray, we don't go through Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's not the mediator. We don't go through any saints, either dead or alive, right? We go directly to God when we pray to God. Because he's all knowing and he's all hearing. Oh, one, one more important aspect of prayer. Every single prophet of God, he, they used to pray the way that Muslims are praying. And you'll be thinking, really? What's the evidence? The evidence is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse number 3 says that when the time for prayer came, Abraham, he went to a secluded place. Over there, he put his forehead on the ground and he was praying to one God. Means prostrating, right? That's how you saw us pray. And Moses and Joshua, it says in Numbers, book of Numbers, they used to pray the same way. They did uh, ablution, cleaning of their pores, and then they stood up and then they prayed, putting their forehead on the ground. Speaking about Jesus, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse number 39, when they were coming after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane. Over there, he put his forehead on the ground and he said that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me. Not my will, but your will. So he was praying exactly the same way that we Muslims are praying now. So we say that we are following the way, the faith and the rituals of all the prophets and messengers. Not just Muhammad, peace be upon him. So those are some extra bonus for you, <laughs> adding. Okay. Good question, by the way. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, during the message and the um, what was being repeated back? Like I know when um, like in a Christian faith when in the prayer? Um, yes. Okay, fine. So so the question is what were there what are they saying back? when the Imam was doing the prayer. Mostly they say Ameen. So after the Imam recites the very first chapter, the very first chapter is a supplication to God that, Oh God, keep us guided on the right path. Basically that's what it says. So then the Muslim, all the group, we are saying Ameen. That, may, that means may, may be so. Then when we get up from the from bowing that's when the imam says that sami allah hamida rabbana wa lakal hamd that 
it's, it's like a, we, are, we are repeating the majesty of God and then people are saying behind that you know we also repeat the majesty of God and many times when the Imam says Allahu Akbar some people they also say Allahu Akbar as they change the motion of the prayer or different uh, motions in the prayer so basically the Imam is the one who does the recitation and the rest of us we are just supposed to follow him in the action <laughs> yes. yes I was hoping you, uh, you could finish your response to the question I had asked before about um, if the Quran teaches that Muhammad was sinless right right so, so the question again going back to it the Quran says that not only Muhammad peace be upon him all the prophets they are um, they are innocent means okay every prophet has two natures by the way one nature is their their, their prophetic responsibility and then they are all humans also in their human capacity because they are not all knowing they can make human mistakes in their human capacity for example suppose if one of the prophet I mean all the prophets if they have to go and take the goats right for gazing now they may not know that if it's going to rain or not they may just go there out of their human knowledge they may make that mistake of not going the right time the right place to take the goats out but suppose if God gave them the responsibility you know what today go and recite this and invite the non-muslims and the leaders of the of the polytheist in the capacity of the prophethood not a single prophet is going to rebel they are perfect they are innocent and they are sinless in that capacity not only muhammad peace be upon him not only jesus by the way but all the prophets of god and this is a difference between the old testament and the new old testament and the quran in the old testament you may have seen you may have read that many major sins are being attributed to the old testament prophets like noah committing incest some other prophets you know drinking idol worship all of the major sins but what the quran does is quran came and it gave that nobility the honor of to all the prophets of the past means how can i believe in a prophet that may have committed major sins prophets are supposed to be the role models the most credible the best people in the society so what the quran is saying that if God is giving a revelation to a person, why would I believe in that person if the person is a sinner like me? So all the prophets in Islam, they are sinless, they are innocent in their prophetic responsibility. We were talking on the way up and we were wondering if this community mm -hmm. uh, here is predominantly Sunni or Shi, or whether everybody comes here to worship together. Oh, right, so this masjid is not labeled as a Sunni or a Shia but it is labeled just as a Muslim community center. A Muslim is a person who holds fast to the fundamentals of Islam and that is the only label that God has given in the Quran to the follower of Islam. Chapter 22 verse number 78, not a Sunni, not a Shia but a Muslim. So everyone is welcome by the way and we don't uh, have a sign up sheet up there are you Sunni, Shia because for us all of us are Muslims but, but majority of the people who come here are from the Sunni right, side but there is one Islam there is no separate Sunni Islam, separate Shia Islam there is only one Islam that God has sent for humanity through Muhammad peace be upon him were you here when I gave that more comprehensive answer to this topic, Sunni Shia? No, but no? I, and I was more, I was more interested in what what's happening. Oh, okay, okay, who come here, right? Yeah. So again, you know, just to highlight more about that, Sunni and Shia, we are not analogous to Protestants, Catholics, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians. All the Muslims, we are we are labeled as Muslims in the Quran and we are unified in the fundamentals we have the same concept of God unlike our Christian brothers and sisters right some Unitarians they don't acknowledge Jesus to be son of God or divine Jehovah's Witnesses they take Jesus to be son of God only but 
our Catholic and Protestant brothers and sisters, they may take Jesus to be a divine son, part of the Trinity, God. All the Muslims, doesn't matter anywhere in the world, we have only one version of the Quran in Arabic. Translations, yes, but in Arabic, original one version, which is the word of God. But our Christian brothers and sisters, they may have different versions. You know, the Protestant version may have uh, 66 books, Catholic 73 books, uh, Greek Orthodox 78 books in the Bible. So our Christian brothers and sisters, they are divided in different versions. Muslims are united in one version of the Quran. Who is Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the Muslims, we say that he is a man, a messenger, flesh and blood. Not son, not divine, but just a human, a, a messenger. But our Christian brothers and sisters, they may take Jesus. The Unitarians may take him as a prophet. Jehovah's Witness, only a son of God. Others, maybe a God. And all the Muslims are united about the hereafter. You know, when that person was saying about China, it reminds me that, suppose if I go to China, I have never been to China. If I go to China, I will feel at home in the mosque. Because the way that you have seen Muslims pray, the Muslims in China pray exactly the same way. Compared to our, you know, Christian different sects, they may pray different ways. Catholics may have a different way, mass, service. Protestants different and different faiths, different ways. So in that way, Muslims are united. There are some, some theological variations, but when it comes to fundamentals, they are all unified following one Islam. We gotta go soon, but do you have any last questions? Something that you... So these guys are taking a class that um. is about Christianity and Islam, sort of the relationship between the two faiths. And I don't know what the the folks from Spring Arbor would. I mean, no, I know their class is kind of different, but I wonder if you have any last thoughts for us about. I know at our university we've we've been talking about neighborliness and you know what it means to be a good neighbor and. Can, can we do this relationship better? What are you, like, what, what are you guys talking about when, we, when you talk about how we can relate to one another as brothers and sisters, Christians and Muslims? How can we, be, how can we improve that relationship? Right, right. That's, that would be a good uh, you know, discussion to depart for today, right? Inshallah. So that what, can be, what should be some action items? You know, it's really important. Not just the Quran, but all in the New Testament speaks about how to be a good neighbor. In fact, uh, as I mentioned before, the Quran, Muhammad peace be upon him, he says that you're not a full human, that you're not a full Muslim if you eat your full and your neighbors are hungry. So making sure our immediate neighbors, our far away neighbors, that we take care of them, that we know them, forget about taking care, right? We have to know them first. <laughs> we have to know them and then know the needs of them so we can take care of them, number one. But the second important step is not knowing is the really basic thing that we can do. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, he used to work with the neighbors. And he formed a, a allegiance called the allegiance of the righteous, Hilful Fudur in Arabic. So what he did along with the non-Muslims and the neighbors, he formed that alliance to take care of the people whose rights are taken away from the neighborhood. The poor, the meek, the needy, the oppressed. So that would be the second level that we can do. The third level would be, you know, all the ills of the society. Our faith speaks about the same thing, that how we can come together to fight the ills of the society, the racism, the drug abuse, the prostitution, and the breakdown of the family structure. So our mosque, this mosque, along with many churches and synagogues, we have many programs that we work together, not just interfaith dialogue, but also working together to make society better. So these are some minimum things that we can do but then the last important passage of the Quran then we can depart would be this would be in chapter 49 of the Quran verse number 13 God is speaking to all of humanity and God is saying that O oh mankind I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into people and nations and tribes that you get to know each other not that you may hate and despise each other you get to know each other. And God is saying that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered person. So I hope and pray that in their spirit of humanity and unity, fighting for justice, 
bringing peace this is what we can do despite some minor differences us as coming on the platform of humanity we can work on many many projects to make humanity great again thank you